are off to the races. And I just made a comment about that I spend too much time on pictures. And so here we are. Okay. So this is the old agenda um, that we <coughs> have been talking about each week. And we were doing it in four phases, which we're still going to. Um, and we were starting phase two today, which we're still going to, modeling algorithms. But I, um, I, I want to rearrange three and four and put the last session actually kind of pulling it all together because there are some algorithms we can't write until we have 3D stuff and circuits and all that for the control loops. So here's the new agenda. So we're going to spend today, <laughs> this video is going to be great, I'm going to be chewing for the first 10 minutes. Um, we're going to spend today talking about more system concepts. We're going to introduce uh, the, the new project. Um, and then next, next week, we'll do state flow stuff, which is another way of working with logic. Really, really cool. Super helpful for us. And then we'll do phase three in 3D. So we'll do SolidWorks for a couple weeks. And, uh, and then pull all that stuff back into Simulink, into Simul Simscape multibody. And, uh, <clears throat> and then spend phase four creating circuits to drive that 3D geometry. That way we have some context. Otherwise, we're going to be making circuits without anything to drive. Um, it's just not, you don't, you don't really get the context and, oh great, I can push the cylinder back and forth, but why do I care? So this way we'll have some geometry to push around. And then we'll spend the final seminar uh, looking at control loops, not, not control theory, but just making some loops around things and have some fun and see if we can hit them, hit things. And, um, and you'll see as, as we go, we'll, we'll still be shooting at stuff. Um, <laughs> it's just fun to do, but um, we'll still be sh we'll still be shooting at things that just we're going to be constantly improving our uh, resolution and our fidelity in the model. So today's agenda, um, there's about 30 slides, so I've cut down the slides, and we're going to spend more time in Simulink. And uh, I don't have my mouse on. Anyway. Um, that is intentional. I think uh, as things are going along. Um, it's a sort of class, right? Um, but I don't want it to become so far away from lab, so far away from getting our hands dirty that you guys go to sleep and I'm bored talking. So uh, we're going to go through just a few modeling concepts, and these are like a slide each. So we're going to talk about top-down versus bottom-up design, and we're going to talk about hierarchical thinking and models. It's kind of a generic thing. And then we'll talk about multi-rate simulation, continuous and discrete time. And then we'll, we'll talk about a few simulate concepts that some, most of them we'll need today. And then there's a few things I just wish someone had told me about because they're super helpful. So I'll talk a little bit about subsystem types. And then we'll get into the project. Um, so in the project, we'll, we'll introduce it, kind of give some context, um, create uh, a high-level model. And, and I'll show you what I mean from a top-down point of view. And then we'll start building some of the building blocks shell tracking and target tracking and things like that. So, modeling concepts first. Um, who's heard of bottom-up, top-down, at any level? Heard, heard those words together, in a sense. Yeah, one, maybe. Okay, so it's, a, it's not like a right or wrong thing. It's not like, oh, we do it this way, so we're old school, and we do it this way, so we're you know, the, the rebels, it, it, it's just style. And it, it, you know, one might be more appropriate in a particular situation versus another. And what I find for myself is I end up doing both in different places on the same project. So what bottom-up modeling is, is it's kind of like if you think of uh, how you build a car, um, and maybe you want to build a car at a junkyard, so bottom-up modeling is where you go get all the parts, see what you have, and see if you can make something with it. So you're building things from the base up. Um, top-down modeling is when you start and say, I had a dream, and it was this bubble-looking thing. And then, you, and then you create a visualization and a concept, and then you, you know, carve it out of clay, and, and you push down and push down and push down until finally you have this, uh, this really... 
guess you'd say concept or high level motivated um, project. And so this also has a lot to do with the size of the operations and, and what you're doing. So, so a lot of times smaller companies tend to be more bottom up modeling because of the project they're working on. Um, they have a smaller set of people, it's easier to manage. Um, top down tends to happen like in the federal government and large corporations because they need to manage from the top down. So anyway, um, basically bottom up is solving small problems and you start to build them together. Um, you get this firm foundation of a groundwork and you get to be testing all these little pieces, all the bricks of it, you can test them individually. Um, but you, you miss the overall context of let's look at the big problem we're trying to solve here. And top down is just the reverse of that. You look down on the entire problem, you figure out, oh, these are these interfaces, these are, you know, these functional requirements, whatever you need to do, and you uh, try to push down from the top and get to smaller and smaller pieces until you're at the place where you can build something. Um, and they both, like, like I show here, they both have advantages. And, and for me, what I usually end up doing is starting at the top and working down till I have a good sense of where we are and then building stuff up from the bottom to, to fill it in. And that's what we're going to do. Okay, uh, so I guess I just talked about this. This is what we're going to do. We're, we're kind of going to do what we need to do. And there's, there's no rules of you should always do this way or that way. But we're going to start at the top because we need the context. And then we're going to build it out just a little bit kind of give ourselves some place to hang the meat, you know, kind of the skeleton, and then we'll, we'll um, start hanging meat on it. Okay, hierarchical thinking. Um, it almost seems like I, I, I don't want to talk too long about this. It almost seems like it, it might be an obvious thing, but I wanted to mention it because it's everywhere you look. Like if when we get the SOLIDWORKS, that's a hierarchical model. Simulink is a hierarchical model. If you look at any kind of software structure, even though there might be calls, you know, this calls this over here, it always ends up looking like a hierarchical model because if you think about the call stack, that's a hierarchy. We're just talking about context switching. Um, so the architectural question that we're working on, I mean, we're going to be solving little problems, but the architectural question we're wondering is how do we, how do we take this complex system, which is going to be our coastal defense system, and how do we break that into littler pieces that are easier to understand? And so when I say hierarchical thinking, I'm just talking about how do we, how do we think top down or how do we think organizationally so we can manage the complexity? Because remember the first, one of the first uh, weeks we, we talked about complexity in, in terms of models and we talked about how you don't, you don't want to make things overcomplicated, but you never want to go too, too simple. You know, make something as simple as you can and no simpler. And there was that balance we talked about model fidelity. And, and this project has some complexity. So if we don't wrap it up and organize it, it's going to be overwhelming for us to solve it. So that's, that's why we're talking about this now. Um, so some of those issues are how can we maximize the reuse of components? Because we don't want to solve the same problem two or three times. We want to solve it once. Or if there are similar problems, maybe we can solve it once with some variants. Um, <clears throat> if we have multiple solutions for those, those very similar problems, we have to update them separately. Can we set it up so that it forces us to update them all together? You know, that's a, a useful thing and it sort of keeps us, keeps us safe. We want to build in the architecture so that when we make a change, that we're safe about it. Um, what if it's easier to write? code instead of use blocks, you know, and some people, um, some people have that uh, almost bias against, hey, I'm a coder, you know, I don't, I don't use block diagrams, that's, that's for little kids. And, and sometimes they have a really good argument, like it's harder to express the thing you want to express in a whole bunch of blocks versus 10 lines of code. And so we'll talk about that a little today, because um, we want to organize that and make the best use of time we can. And, uh, and then we'll talk a little bit about managing the complexity of dimensions and sizes of things inside the simulating model. Okay, I'll just pause for a second. Maybe take a bite of pizza. Any thoughts, questions? Hello, Brad. Hey. Good. Okay. 
Can anybody tell me the difference? You've probably already read the slide, but hey, Jackson. Um, Multi-rate versus fixed and variable rate. Yeah, I mean, we've talked about variable rate and fixed rate before, right? We Remember last week we introduced Simulink and they had variable step solvers, right? And it figured out right where the boundary of the bouncing ball was and created a step point there. Remember that? Um, so that's, that's variable versus fixed rate, but what on earth is multi-rate? I guess one thing I can think of is... Um, if you have a microcontroller that's controlling a bunch of things, you might have like some timers that are going really fast that are checking some things. Uh, and then you have the processor, like the main core, which is going the fastest. Right. But it's saying, oh, you know, this part, I can get to that point so quickly, so. Right. Um, no. Yeah, no, exactly, exactly. I, the, the whole thing is, why do any extra work? <laughs> like, <Yeah, right. laughs> we, don't, we don't need to spin really fast to do something that doesn't need to be done that fast. And the stuff that doesn't need to be done fast, we need to do it that fast, so we can't minimize that complexity. Complexity. So that's so multi-rate is just all that means is the model contains different rate groups. So, like you said, maybe the sensor is a temperature sensor. We don't have to we don't have to um, sample that at a, at a kilohertz because temperature doesn't change that fast. Or at least most temperature doesn't change that fast. Yeah, hopefully not. <laughs> um, but then again, maybe there's some position thing that you're monitoring, and that. Maybe it's this little tiny, I don't know, wire. And so it can move super fast, so you got to sample that really fast. And so anyway, um, so I, we're going to talk about in the next slide continuous versus discrete time. Uh, maybe just a quick show of hands. Heard of this? Never heard of it? Yes, you have heard of it? OK, OK. Um, if you've gotten into digital versus analog, Digital and analog are the two communication types that make use of discrete and continuous information. So continuous time is time information in the continuous domain. Discrete time is discrete information, <laughs> right? So you're, that make, everybody got that? Yeah. So when you were talking, for example, the other week about uh, sound, you know, when you're, when you're looking at sound in a computer, it's sampling at discrete points in time and saying, okay, at this time, I'm, you know, this amplitude, this time I'm this amplitude, right. nothing in between. Right. And then that's discrete on the x-axis. It is. And, 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 um, but there's a little bit more to it than that because it's the, it's the framework that you think about continuous time versus discrete time because we have to take discrete steps with the solver, right? And maybe you're using fixed step or maybe you're using a variable step. But continuous time means that the software thinks that something might be happening in between those steps. Like, it, 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 the, the software's frame of mind says, stuff has happened since I was here last. Versus discrete time, the software itself is saying, that was then, this is now, nothing's happened. It's like a step. Like a, you follow what I'm saying? When I say step, like a stair step. And that was at that level, and now I'm at this level. I was at that time. And now I'm at this time. It, it's like time is intentionally standing still with discrete time. For that, for that period, nothing moves. Continuous time, the framework of thought is stuff is moving. And so the solver thinks about it differently. So when we think about physical systems, they live in continuous time, right? Like we could keep zooming in and we'd keep finding something moving. We'd never... Um, if you could zoom in fast uh, into a small enough realm, you'd see atoms oscillating, and, and you could just keep going, right? And after a while, you'd see light waves and all that stuff. Versus, I think, the canonical example on the other side is software. Software is very stateful, and it takes steps. And it might be variable steps, or it might be uh, fixed size steps, but it takes steps. And there's nothing happening on a on a logical level between those times. I'm not talking about the representation you know, with an analog signal. No, I'm not talking about any of that stuff. Just how you think about software, how software is designed to operate. Does that make sense? Hopefully we're on the same page. Okay, so 
There's a couple new things that I wanted to introduce about Simulink. Get a little pizza. The first one is MATLAB functions. And uh, this is in the user defined functions in the library. And the reason these are so great is because if you don't want to solve the problem with blocks, you can grab one of these and drop it in, and it's a block that contains code. So let's, uh, let's use that real quickly. I'll show you what I mean. While that's loading up, um, you have to be aware that a MATLAB code block has a sample time. You have to set it. It can be inherited, it could be variable, it could be fixed. It can never be continuous, but it's going to have a sample time. Usually, um, unless it's triggered or conditionally run, usually it's some fixed sample time. So um, I'll show you what I mean. There we go. All right. Is this just super clear or? Uh, I don't know. You guys seem very quiet. Maybe it's the, maybe it's the microphone. I don't know. Okay. Good. So I'm going to pull up a new Simulink model here. Isn't that funny how you? You change your voice when you know you're being recorded, so you want to project and not sound slouchy or anything. It's different. I, I catch myself sounding different than I would have normally. Maybe that's better, though. I <laughs> right. I don't snort as much. You know. <laughs> uh, so I'm opening up a blank model here. Um, raise your hands again. Who's used Simulink at, at least a little bit? Okay. Okay. Um, it's going really slow. There we go. Okay, so I'm opening the library too. And uh, what I'm going to do is, let's see. So I'm going to go to down here to user defined functions and grab a MATLAB function and drop it in. Um, so let's, let's use it for something real quick just so we get our hands dirty of how this thing works. Um, <clears throat> maybe we want to write a real quick average function. And we're probably going to do that or a, a running grouping uh, function. Um, so if I, if I use a source like a ramp, for example, I'll do a step. That's easier to see. Okay, so here's a step. Okay. So the step is zero, uh, the sample time is zero, which um, implies that it's going to be continuous or can be connected to a continuous thing. This, in order to set the sample time, you right click on it and you go to block parameters and you set the sample time explicitly. So if you leave it minus one, it'll be inherited and then the solver decides when it runs. But um, why don't we set it for like 0.1 seconds? So one tenth of a second, and then we'll put a scope here, and then we'll double click on this scope and, and ask for two axes so that we can look at two different things. Okay, so now I have two inputs to the scope, and I would like to look at the input and the output to the function. So here's the I'm going to do this, let's see, let's do this for two seconds. So that's a, remember I just set the um, simulation runtime, right, up here. Okay, so this step is going to happen at time one, and the initial value is going to be zero, and the final value is going to be one. So we can take this MATLAB function double click on it, and it opens up just like we have a function inside Simulink. And so we have the normal function keyword, and then exactly the same 
context or syntax that we have for a normal MATLAB function. The only difference is we can't use everything in MATLAB. We can use a lot of it, but not everything. Um, and so all the normal stuff like you know, array manipulation and uh, transposing and permutation and all you know all the kind of things that you you want to use when you're manipulating vectors and arrays is all there, and typical math functions like sine and cosine and tangent those are all there, but you can't do things. Um, it's basically the embedded MATLAB subset, so you, you can't do things that, uh, for example, aren't it couldn't be deterministically coded. Um, so there's 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 calls there's functions in MATLAB that you could call that are like Monte Carlo, you know, simulations where you're trying every possible combination of things, and those kinds of things you can't call from the embedded embedded MATLAB uh, because that's not practical from an embedded standpoint to try to generate code for. Um, yeah. Could you call another simulate model? Um, not from within this. We, we will see later how you can do that, but yeah. So the the context, but it's a good it's a good point um, that we can't call. I have to say this because they couldn't hear you. Uh, whoever's online watching this, um, he asked if we could. Doesn't that feel weird? You have to talk to someone else. That's that's okay. Uh, Ron asked if <laughs> this could call a simulating function, um, and no, it it can't directly because of the scoping of this. So this doesn't have the context to call another function. Um, the only scope this has is what the embedded MATLAB um, subset of the language and the input parameters, in our case just u. So it sounds, at first it sounds like, ah man, it's, it's so much smaller, but, but really when you're trying to like solve little embedded problems, it's great, it's fantastic because, uh, well let's just solve, let's just solve a quick one, okay? And you'll see what I mean. So right now all it does is y equals u, doesn't help us think of a lot. Um, let's just do a, a, an average, a running average of three samples, how about? Um, so I'm gonna skip forward to the next slide and we'll talk more about what I'm doing uh, in that slide. Um, or I could, yeah, yeah, we just have to do it together. Okay, so very often within um, an embedded MATLAB function because you Every, every time step, the function gets called again. So you don't have the context of the last call because all, all of your variables go out of scope. And so you may have declared like val equals uh, u times three or something like that. But then the next time it gets called, there is no val. Okay, so in order to get around that, you use the keyword persistent. And that's, a, that's one of the 20 or so keywords in the MATLAB language. And we'll say uh, persistent, let's call it bank, and semicolon. And it feels kind of weird in MATLAB because we're used to it being dynamic and we don't have to declare types. And, and we're not declaring data type, we're declaring the longevity of the variable is all we're doing. Okay? Is it kind of like you're declaring a global variable? Not global. Static. It's like, it's more like static. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So it, it's still scoped to this, but it's going to hold on to its value as long as the model is running. Okay. So, so now we're faced with something else though, another problem that we just have to be aware of, that we have something called bank and we don't want to assign a value to it to initialize it because that would overwrite what's in it but it currently doesn't have anything in it, so how do you initialize the thing? It's like, how do you touch it just once? Because this gets called every single time step. You follow, follow the issue? So the way you handle that is you use the isEmpty function. So you say, if bank, oops, if is empty bank, so that just returns true or false. So when you declare a persistent variable, it starts out empty. And empty isn't NAN, it's not, it's not the NAND value, it's not the null value, it's not zero. It's a different state of a variable, and it just means there's nothing in it. <laughs> it's never been initialized. So we have, to, we have to first ask, if you haven't been initialized, okay, then do something. And after that, don't touch it. 
Okay, so we say if is empty, and here we're going to give it a size and an implicit type. Um, so if is empty, bank equals zeros. Why don't we make it? Uh, let's make it five long. Okay, and end. So there's our little initialization block, and we can take this block um, and do it for however many variables we need. And for each variable, you have to do if is empty and do this thing. Um, sometimes I put it all in one line just to save a little space, but I think it's easier to see the first time this way. Okay, so now something else about MATLAB functions. Whereas, you remember before, we could change sizes all we wanted to. We could change types, sizes, all, the, all that with it, within the context of a particular run, run of a MATLAB function inside a simulink model. You can't change the size. You're stuck. So when you initialize the the, uh, when you initialize the variable, or even if you didn't have a persistent variable, if you know if your input is you, you couldn't say something. Huh? Oh, you couldn't say something like if uh, u equals four, then y, uh, then bank equals zeros four by one, else bank equals zeros four by five. It'll complain at you to, but if you try to do that. So these are, and if you think about it, this makes a lot of sense because we have to be able to generate C code, C++ code from this. And typically you, you can tweak some stuff with, with uh, sizes and dynamic allocation, but typically when you're generating that, you do not want to dynamically allocate memory because that affects performance, determinism, and all that kind of stuff. So that's why it's not letting you change those things. So, all right. So without going further into that, let's, now we have a bank. It's five by one, so five rows, one column. Um, and we'll just say bank equals u bank uh, one, one to n minus one. Okay, so what I'm doing here is I'm just shifting. I'm sticking the U in the front, and I'm taking the previous value of bank, and I'm taking all but the last value, and setting it on the same, uh, in the same variable. Um, so, in other words, this goes, um, we, we take in this new U, right? And that gets stuck at the, at the first index of the bank, and then all the remaining indexes use all but one of what it was previously. So just think of it as you're bumping one off the, off the trailer. It's like a, a running window going along a sequence of numbers. And so why this is kind of helpful, and I don't, honestly, I don't know why MATLAB doesn't have any kind of a dynamic running average type of block. It seems like they should because they use it all the time. But they don't. Um, they have running averages, but nothing that continually moves the window, if that makes sense. They have ones that continually um, update the value as more values come in. Anyway, so all we have to say is y equals the mean of bank, and we just created our first MATLAB running average. Okay, so let's see if this works. Um, and you can, if you go to the editor, you can run this from here, but I just want to save it, and it's going to say, hey, you haven't saved the model yet. So I'm going to say this is our average, our AVG for running average. I'll just call it our average one. And then go back to the model here. And I'm just opening up. Okay, I'm to make sure that, uh, I'm pretty sure I set the sample time already at 0.1. What does this look like when we run it? That. Of course we have a problem. Um, oh. So instead of using end, um, I'm just going to define a variable called n equals 5. And I just make this n. All right. Oh, come on.
Okay. So I'm going to run this, and I'm going to set a breakpoint at it, and let's take a look at what these things have in it. Oh, come on. You're not even going to let me do this. Hmm. Dimensions of matrices. N minus 2. just did this an hour ago. Let me double check what I did. <laughs> uh, okay. Put it in the front, shift one over, go to the end. Okay. Should be the same thing, but it's five by, oh, I remember why. Okay. Sorry about this, guys. Um, so we said Bank is n rows tall and one column wide. And I tried to add a column because I put a comma there instead of a semicolon. That's what it was. So this should be a semicolon because I'm concatenating rows to the end. So I need the semicolon to put it at the end. Let me change this back to n minus 1. Okay. How embarrassing. That way. Seems like a kind of stack on, right? Add on to it. Yeah. No, I'm not doing well today. Two seconds. Vertical rate solver. So that's kind of what we expected, I think, right? It, it has five long, so as soon as y changed values with the step, or the u changed values with the step, let me show you the model again here. Okay, so the step came in, and that's the yellow that we see. And then we created this little running average, and that dynamically shifted a window and averaged it along. So right at, right after the transition, we see that it's starting to average up. And that's why an average is just a low-pass filter of, of a kind, right? Um, so these little MATLAB functions, tremendously helpful. They're like, you know, I need a, they're like the little silver bullet. I just need to solve something real quick. There's not an, there's not an easy way to do it with blocks. Um, and, and I think you'll find when you start solving problems that are more complex, they're fantastic because you just you just need a little thing to glue this to this, or you need something to detect a pulse and output a true value or whatever you need. Um, they're fantastic that way. And the nice thing is, they don't typically they're not these massive code blocks. You're not writing tons and tons of code, so you open it up and it's 10, 20, 100 lines of code, and and they're digestible. Um, so. That is a MATLAB function. Keep uh, keep the questions coming if if you need to. Okay, so that's a MATLAB function. <clears throat> so we talked about all those. Okay, and they talked about these two: the persistent and is empty. I think it's easier to easier to pull this in in context, right? Like as opposed to looking at the entire slide and then and then doing it. I guess that's just a point of view, but um, this will obviously be in the slide so you can look at it later. Okay, so now let's talk a little bit about abstraction types. So we, yeah. Um, so, so just to clarify, um, persistent just means that after the function's done calling, it's doing other stuff in that lab, then it comes back to that function. It has the lost value in between those two times. During the run of the, during the run of the simulation of that Simulink model, right. it hasn't lost it. Okay, 
So, but like during the actual running of the function, you can manipulate or do whatever you want with that um, with that persistent variable. Sure, it behaves just like any other variable. Yeah, yeah. It's only it's only from time step to time step the persistent yeah is helping. Uh -huh. Okay. So I'm not going to go into a tremendous amount of detail on this. This I just want to tell you as kind of an overview. And when you need when you need these blocks, go read the help documentation because there's a lot to them. Um, but sometimes people just say, oh, put it in a subsystem. But there's a whole bunch of different kinds of subsystems. And so um, I want to talk to you about kind of the categories and, and what some of them are. So that way you've heard of them. And if you need them, you're like, ah, I've heard of something that does that, and you go find it. Um, so first of all, categorically, there are virtual and non-virtual subsystems. And um, let me show you what I mean here. If I go back to MATLAB. These things always take so much longer than I would expect to say. Um, I guess that's okay. It's just, just life. Okay, ports and subsystems is the category on the, on the library browser. <coughs> and you, you notice there's there's even more things here than what I've listed, but some of these things, there are a few more than what I've listed, but this is breaking it down so you can combine them a little bit different way. So just the standard subsystem is right here, right? And we've talked about this last time, that a subsystem is just something to abstract. It's, it's kind of like a function, right? And so um, we talked about hierarchical systems. Inside Untitled, I have this subsystem called subsystem. I'll call this, oops. What? Let me change your name here. Oh. There we go. That was weird. Level one. Okay, and I can go into level one and put level some, some other level, level two, and I can go into level two and put in level three. And so on the, on the left-hand side, you can see that the hierarchical structure we're building, right? Okay, now we're building this, and we've been talking about managing the complexity, right? We've been talking about how do we organize the model so it's not overwhelming. But, um, and, and subsystems are a fantastic way to do that, but... Um, if you so if you right click and go to the block prop, block parameters, um, there's a few different options here. But one of the key ones is treat as atomic unit. And so what it's talking about is, okay, organizationally, when we look inside the subsystem, that stuff is a unit to us, right? But the way Simulink solves it doesn't force it to behave as a unit. Like there might be other rates going on that are happening differently. So a virtual subsystem is one where the only purpose is to help you organize your thoughts. It doesn't constrain the model otherwise. So it gives a lot more freedom to what's going on inside. On the other hand, as soon as you click on treat as atomic unit, then sample time comes up. And, and that way you're forcing stuff underneath that's inside that subsystem to work at a maximum of this sample rate. So a non-virtual subsystem has executional implications. A virtual subsystem is just organizational. Does that, that make sense? So one you're just using to organize your thoughts. The other one you're actually changing how it executes. Um, and if we look back at the, uh, the slide here, um, there's a, there are more than one type of non-virtual subsystem. There's atomic. There's also conditional things like if statements. So if you think about blocks of code, and we use that analogy back to blocks of code, it, you can make if, if subsystems that only execute under certain conditions. And they're automatically non-virtual they, because they have to be constrained in how they execute. Just, just like way a bit of, of code inside an if block doesn't get the freedom to execute whenever it wants. So it's implicitly non-virtual. Am I making sense? You guys are kind of looking blankly at me. Okay, all right. Okay, um, so 
those are the two broad categories. Now, there's also on the right hand side, we're talking about kind of different, uh, different aspects of the subsystem. So a model reference subsystem is, remember we were talking about how we might want to update something in one place. We might want to use it in five places, but update it in one. So you can build a model externally. Um, so let me just do this real quick and show you what I mean. <clears throat> so if I say, let's see, I need an import in one, and I'll make a second one, and then I need an out port, out one. Yeah, that's enough. And then I'll just save this, and I'll call it ref underscore model. Okay, now if I start a new model up here, and I want to make use of that, I can refer to it, and I can use a model reference subsystem, and it has this, uh, these little chamfers on the corners, and it's saying, uh, you haven't told me what you want to use here, I'll use whatever you want, so I'm going to put in reference model, and then it's going to look and find that model, and it has the ins and outs of the model I defined in the other one. So it's, if you've used SOLIDWORKS and, you know, there's external references, typically when you're, everybody use, anybody use SOLIDWORKS here at all? Okay, it's not a good example then. <laughs> okay, forget SOLIDWORKS. Um, <laughs> but this is super helpful because sometimes you're literally, you literally have like a hundred subsystems and they're each working on a channel. And you go change one and then you forget that you have a hundred copies of that thing. Because you can... You know, you can uh, create a subsystem, right? And maybe you do something cool and you put a gain in it. And, you know, very complicated subsystem here, right? It has a gain of two. And then... <clears throat> oh, Cortana's... Play, comment, get it by when you're ready, come. <sighs> Stop. Okay, so you can copy and paste the subsystem, go back and change the original and make this three. Sorry. <laughs> I don't know if that's even one of my songs, so <laughs> that was kind of strange. Yeah, yeah, that's funny. So we just changed this to three, right? And this one over here is still two, because it's just a copy. So uh, versus, um, oops, versus with this, if we double click, it takes us into a separate model. I could add another output and paste it, hit escape. Uh, oops, I gotta save though. Save. Now it has three. And if I go over here and make a copy of it, go in here and make a second out port, and save, of course, hit escape. Now they both have two out ports. So it's just something to be aware of. I, I don't know why I just didn't dig hard enough or no one told me about it, but. I've done some big projects where I'm like, all right, I have 64 channels. Copy, paste, copy, paste, copy. And after a while, you're like, uh, that would have been a better block to use. So that's why I'm telling you about it. That is the model reference. Um, if you have a yeah. name, like a single, let's say, name of Gavin 2, uh -huh. um, and all the models that are named Gavin 2, when, once you change a property of one of them, it'll duplicate that property to all of them? Or Right. So if I if I double uh, if I right click on this and go to block parameters, it's saying, "What model do you want me to look at?" Okay. Um, and so you can browse or or create a new model. And so if I wanted to go into something else, I could. It won't let you reference itself, but yeah. That, that, does that answer your question? Kind of. I mean, so let's say um, you created a model and has whatever name. Is it a property of that that all those models that share that same name update together? Or um, because I noticed that you added an extra what output on ref model and it changed both ref models. Do you have to change a specific ref model for it to populate to all of them? Or do you have to change some reference like a? A reference somewhere else, or 
or how do you make it so that it duplicates all those other ones? Yeah. So it's it's the type of the subsystem that's that's forcing it to duplicate to all the other ones. So um, let's just say I I oops, did it again. If I go to block properties here on one of these, and instead of going to ref model, I go to browse and I use whatever name and say OK. So now that's pointed at whatever name. OK. So if I copy this, it's like a pointer. Right. If I copy the pointer, that one's still, they're both pointing at the same model. Right. But what I'm, I'm missing, missing. missing. What is that? Where is that model? So I understand the idea of pointers. OK. Well, they're both pointing at something. Where is that thing? Is it circular so they're all pointing to each other? Or do you have to go somewhere else to edit that original item so it propagates uh, to? Oh, when you double click on it? Is that what you're saying? Yeah, I might have missed something. <laughs> OK. OK. Uh, yeah. Let me, uh, let me show you this. So there's, there's only one model named whatever name. Okay. They're all pointing to that. When you go in here and you double click on it, it's opening whatever name. Okay, okay. See how that's like the highest thing in the hierarchy? Uh, that makes sense. Yeah. It, it was a little confusing when I did it the first time too. Yeah, because I'm used to it kind of going, diving deeper into the layers. And right. I was thinking, oh, that's whatever name, you know, instance one, whatever name, instance two. Right. And then I wasn't sure if they just talked to each other, but apparently that's, that's the pointer that's referencing to, they're all referencing to the same whatever name. Thing. Exactly. Okay. Exactly. Yeah. Okay, so we talked about non-virtual, right, or atomic. So if we change this, I just want to show you how it changes the way it looks. I say okay. It makes this dark outline versus the light outline. So that's the atomic. When you make this, um, I think you can make this atom. No, you can't. I lied. There's, there's another kind of reference. I, I don't want to muddy the waters with it. There's another, there's another type of model that has a dark instead of light. Um, Jedi. No, it, it has light set of dark corners, um, and I can't remember what it is, so I'm not going to confuse the issue. Does that make sense? Uh, I, that was a good question, Tony. Um, these are pointing at the same external model. Yeah. Mm -hmm. All right. So let's save this one and call it um, model sub. Okay. And time flies. We got to hurry. That's all right. We, we weren't going to be too, too crazy today anyway. All right, back to this guy. Let's talk about a couple more of these. Um, so there's iterator subsystems. And we've used the while loop, and we've used for loops and all those things before. Um, switch case, remember, we used for the piano. Um, there's, there's subsystems that do that for you. And so you could go write the code, but there's stuff that saves you a whole bunch of time. Um, there's conditional subsystems like triggered or enabled, which are kind of the block diagram equivalent of if, else, those sort of things. Um, triggered would be something that's, you know, looking for a rising or falling edge, that kind of trigger. Enabled would be something that it's looking for a level, um, like when this is true, always run, otherwise don't run. Um, and the last thing, and again, I'm not going to go more into those. I, I think. As long as you're aware of them, go read about them if you want to. Um, variant subsystems are pretty cool because maybe you're not sure which model you want to use. So variant subsystems allow, allow you to dynamically change what it's connected to. So let's say let's say we have uh, well we did this last last semester. Um, let's say you have a super high fidelity model, a medium fidelity model, and just a really stupid model. And you're not sure which one you want to connect to the controller because maybe you're trying to figure out how to save time or just tune something quick. So a variant subsystem is kind of like multiple choice. And you can just go to the variant and say, connect this model and suppress the other ones. So that's what variant's about. OK, now in the same way that um, we abstracted block groups with subsystems, we can actually abstract signals. Um, and as soon as things get semi-complicated, you'll see why we want to do this because it gets really messy. It's like looking at a circuit board and there's just wires going any, everywhere. Um, I know a lot of you guys are electrical computer engineers and you probably had to do some kind of wire wrapping, right? Um, in my wire wrapping words it looked ugly, super bad. And it was always hard to follow all that stuff. So in Simulink, there's two really useful concepts 
that you can use to organize your signals, and it makes them nice and clean. Uh, the first one's signal buses, and the second one's multiplexing. Uh, we're going to do multiplexing first, just because that's like vectors, and, uh, and it'll be more familiar first. So let's, let's look at that real quick. All right, uh, so I'll make a new one. Close this one. All right, so let's just say I have three values. And I want to put them in different blocks, OK? I can use what's called a mux or multiplexer with three inputs. to multiplex these together. And I'll just put it in our display. ISP. OK. Come on. All right. So when I hit go here, it's taking these three signals multiplexing them so all of them are on this signal line and then the display is interpreting oh there are three signals on there no problem and and you can actually uh, kind of look into your model because it, it by default it doesn't show them looking any different this looks just like any other line just for simplicity um, but you can change let's see I think it's under display signals and ports so you can change it to a couple different things you can make non-scalar signals like uh, bolded and that way you know oh this isn't a scalar so it's something else um, or you can uh, signals and ports or you can actually put uh, signal dimensions on there so now it has a three next to it and you can you can go as many dimensions as you need to go it's pretty neat you can, you can have right now there's a vector flowing on that signal line you could put a matrix on the signal line. You could put three, four, ten-dimensional data in time going down the line. Pretty cool, actually, when you think about it, because it really cleans things up. So, um, if you, for example, maybe these are three different RGB images, right? So you could have a three by three-dimensional thing happening in time, and all you have to look at is one signal because you just need to pipe the thing around. Okay. So that's cool and very useful. And if you if you want to pull something off of that, all you need is a DMUX. And it has to be the same size. Um, so I'll make it three. I can just type tap into that one. And maybe I want to pull off the third one and put a display right here. Okay. So if I did this right, that should come out as three, and it does. That's the third value. Okay, does everybody get what this is for? It's not, not rocket science, it's just like vectors inside MATLAB. This is the Simulink equivalent. All right, and that's great, except when you have a whole bunch of different types of signals. And some are doubles, and some are something else. And, and these are coming from this kind of sensor, and you can't remember, is it like the 45th vector index down? <laughs> that I've got to pull off of a DMUX, it gets confusing, right? So uh, the way you deal with that is with buses. And buses are, buses are great. They, they have their uses. So we're going to go down here to signal routing and make a uh, where'd he go? There's a vector concatenate bus creator. Okay, so we can we can put these three values. I'm gonna say I want three inputs here. What is that? Bus, bus creator. Yeah. So you can see it's got a, a little different look. It's very similar to the multiplex block, but it's got this little bar in the middle. And I'm just connecting to those same ones. Then I can go into this. But what's cool is now they have names. And remember how we were talking about uh, that the x value is kind of the signal um, when we were last, last week? Well, 
if I want this to be, maybe this is x, and this is y, and this is z, I'll save that, get in here, oh, save this one. Now it's x called x, y, z, okay? And now maybe, um, maybe I want two inputs here. And maybe this bus of x, y, z is a coordinate. And maybe this is, I don't know, a range or something like that. And you want to, we're going to be targeting, right, with battleships and try to hit things. So um, when we look at this, um, it's actually organized in a hierarchical way. So there's chord, and chord has three sub-signals. And we can pull X or Y or whatever we want out of there. And so if we wanted to pull something out, we could. Um, let's, let's do that. So now there's all those signals there. Let's use a, a bus selector. Bus selector. And I, I only want one. I just want the X. Um, Oh, I got to connect it first. I forgot. So I'm going to tap into the bus, and I'm going to pull off just the X. Select that. Coordinate dot X. I'll put a terminator here so it doesn't. Ah, come on. And there it is, X. So. Kind of abstract yourself back from this a little bit and think about think about models that have hundreds of signals that you might vary and say, well, there's the coordinate of this shell that was fired third. You know, maybe you want to pull those signals out and look back at that data. So buses are a really great way to keep yourself organized. All right, so that's enough about that. Any questions though? Um, well, we'll keep rolling if you don't. Okay, sweet. All right, it's time. The coastal defense system over here. Um, I've, I've been doing a little bit of reading about this because it's super interesting stuff. Um, and we're going to base our cannons, well, for, before I get into that, we're, we're, so we're going to model, our, our model is going to contain the software that will be doing things like where does the enemy ship move to and how does it move, the software that will reinterpret the radar stuff and figure out how to get more accurate because radar has its own challenges. Um, and we're going to create the circuits, like the electronic circuits for amplification and sensing. Um, we're going to create the hydraulic circuits that will actually drive uh, how we aim through the barrel. And then we'll create 3D models of a turret and a stand and a barrel and all those things. So we can actually watch this thing work. It's going to be kind of cool. Um, so I, I was watching some stuff on, on battleships, and I've been watching YouTube things all week. Um, and super interesting stuff on the Iowa-class battleships. Um, they have one confirmed hit at 22 miles away. I mean, even the, the, the hang time of the shell is like 30 seconds before it can hit its target. It's pretty amazing. Uh, and, and, you know, you imagine that the enemy is do 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 bam. I mean, that's, that's way past the horizon. You can't see 22 miles unless you're pretty high up. Um, so kind of cool stuff. That's, that's, we're not going to be on a battleship ourselves because then we have to deal with things like how it's rocking and what our orientation is. We'll get to that in a second, what we're going to do, but we're going to fire at ships. So that's our gun inspiration. Uh, they're 16 inch diameter. They're bigger ones, but I, I felt like, you know, uh, this was a, a one that was in use, you know, have some American pride. This is a good one. So 50 caliber, 2,500 feet per second muzzle velocity. They're big, big guns, right? Um, this, this little diagram on the right, these are stories of, it's like people are in those different levels. <laughs> So <laughs> this is like a three or four story building, um, and it's 50 caliber. I didn't realize this till I looked into it, but 50 caliber actually means well, yeah, but it means that 
the length of the gun is 50 times the diameter of the gun. I didn't know that's what it meant until I looked it up. So it has to do with how accurate it is you know, going out there. Um, this is how big the shells are. 2,500 pounds each. Um, they had armor piercing and high explosive shells. Pretty interesting stuff. Um, okay, this is what we're going to shoot at. I figured we have modern, you know, we're making a modern radar controlled thing. And so we're a little bit more sophisticated than World War II, so we might as well shoot at something that's a little faster. So this is an Arle Burke class uh, destroyer. So this is going to be a little bit faster than the battleships they were firing at. Um, but maybe we can hit it. I don't know yet. I haven't. <laughs> we may have to slow it down. I'm not sure if we can hit a, a destroyer or not, but we'll try. Uh, so what is this? It's about 150 meters long or so. Okay, so our position, we're going to be kind of like in a lighthouse, just so we don't have to deal with all the pitching and rolling and orientation and all the other things uh, for the gun. We're not going to have a three... Yeah, pretty much. <laughs> we, just, we just got a really big cannon in a lighthouse. That's what we've got. Just to simplify the problem a little bit more. Um, and that'll, we're also going to put ourselves right in the middle of, of a 20 mile radius. Um, so that's kind of our radar range and that's, I don't know how fast we can hit targets. We'll have to look and see. I mean, we'll experiment and figure out how fast, how big a target can I hit at 20 miles or how big a target can I hit at 10 miles. That's one of the cool things about modeling is you learn all kinds of stuff you never would have known otherwise. So what are we going to do on this today? We've got about 45 minutes left, so the first thing I wanted to do was start with the architectural model and start, start to build this out. Like, what, what are we going to put in there? And write, so write a couple notes about it, and uh, we're not going to get too far into the buses and multiplexers and all that stuff because we don't know what all our signals are yet. We just kind of know, I know I need to handle this. I, we need to do shell tracking. We've got to, there has to be a model of how, you know, where did my shell hit? Otherwise, we'd never know if we hit anything. Um, there has to be something that controls the enemy. Otherwise, we're just, you know, if, if, no, if the enemy never moves, it's kind of a boring game. Um, so we're going to solve some functional problems, and I think we have plenty of time to do shell tracking and target tracking today. Um, target prediction is a little more involved, and because of the fact that, you know, you've got 20 or 30 seconds of hang time on the shell, you have to figure out where your target's going and aim at that. Otherwise, you'll miss. Because it's, have you guys ever seen the movie Quickly Down Under? Um, Tom Selleck. Uh, anyway, he's this long distance shooter, and have you seen it, Alyssa? Oh, okay. Anyway, he's this long distance shooter, and uh, he goes to Australia. It's good. It's a good movie. But anyway, he's shooting at stuff, and he shoots, and then it's one, two, three, you know, whatever, six seconds, and then he hits something, and and it's kind of like that with this, except it's like thirty seconds. And we don't see them. <laughs> so we, we really, that's kind of the cool part of the problem, is that it, even if we had perfect radar, it doesn't do us any good. We have to use software to predict where they're going to be. And if they're further out, we have to predict further out, because it's going to take the shell that much longer to get there. If they're closer, we have to change how far we're looking ahead. So it's going to be some interesting algorithms. We'll do those algorithms next week. Yeah? So we're going to put in curvature and then rotation of the planet? None of that stuff. <laughs> no, we're not going to do curvature and rotation of the Earth. No, I'm not even going to have spinning bullets. <laughs> They're just going to go. But we're going to have gravity. We're going to have air friction. That's uh, about the extent of. <laughs> I mean, it's plenty hard just with those. Um, <laughs> yeah, right. Just in case uh, Newton wasn't quite on. <laughs> so let's start with the overall system model. And we're going to go kind of a. Uh, hog wild on, on subsystems here. So we'll go new, Simulink. I'm really excited about this. I, like I say, I, I, all my time gets sucked down the drain learning about radar and what the actual limitations are. And it's fascinating. I don't know if you guys have looked into that, the S-band and X-band radar and, and what they had now. It's kind of interesting. I, w I was looking to see if I could not know so much and then maybe someone would tell me how accurate their radar is. But I guess it makes sense. I haven't been able to find too many military documents on how accurate their <laughs> radar is, because it's kind of an important thing. Maybe they want to keep <laughs> yeah, a secret, right? Yeah. <laughs> anyway, so that was sort of a, like an aha moment. That's why I can't find it. They don't want anyone to know. But um, anyway, so let's start with some subsystems, right? 
Okay, so we're trying to we're trying to what's that? Oh, you click somewhere and then start typing. Yeah, if you double click, then you're writing a comment. Single click, and then you can. <laughs> nice. Okay, so single click sub subsystem. Okay, so why don't we just kind of do this as a group? What are the things we're going to have to handle? Think about the problem. We've, we've, there's an enemy ship. There's a lighthouse. There's shells. We got to make some decisions. There's radar. There's circuits. How do we want to organize the model? Okay. For their ship. Why is the whole abstraction? I mean, it can't be overstated how helpful it is for not getting oh, huge. too much in the weeds. Yeah, especially on problems like this because what are you going to do? Start writing a MATLAB function that handles all this stuff? Yeah. <laughs> like, you, you, yeah, abstraction is big. <laughs> yeah. I, mean, I can have like three things at a time for me. So. Yeah, no, that's. that's Humanity. <laughs> That's where we are. <laughs> um, yeah, we need our radar. What else do we need? start to do the visualization of it, but uh, we're really just kind of setting up the abstractions and what are we even talking about first. And we will. We'll get there, but yeah. Just on a high level. So we need one for a missile? Well, we're not shooting missiles. We're shooting... Well, I mean, shell, uh, shell properties of... Uh, oh, well, we're going to do that. Mass. We do, but we're going to do that in shell track. Okay. So... Um, we probably need some electronics to interface from the software to hydraulics, right? Amplifiers and stuff like that. So we could. Okay. What else? Huh? What do we have electronics for? Yeah. Well, so we're writing software, right? Right. And that has to communicate. I mean, think about, t okay. That's a good question. Think about um, how if you're if you're tying one signal to the next signal to the next signal, right? If they're blocks, maybe software is the first thing in line. Does that talk directly to a three D model? I mean, think think about a physical connection. Like you have a computer, right? How how does the software talk to anything on the outside? Yeah. How, how does I mean? It's a question. How does? Yeah. So so what's that? you know software. Yeah. Software talks to the all the electronics on the board, which then talk to you know your router, which then talk to servers. And the servers talk to okay, well, A to D's. right, D to A's, A to D's, right, and, and that's that's really we're straddling the continuous time, discrete time, right there, right, with the zero or holds and all that stuff. Okay. So that that's what the electronics are about. Software is totally virtual. Electronics is going to sit. In this weird place between virtual and physical, what else do we need, though? Totally, we've got to have hydraulics. And we'll have, uh, and and we can actually zoom in a little bit into this and say, I want a motor. 
Um, probably we'd use that to change the bearing, right? But to change where we're pointing. Motor for bearing control. And I imagine we'll need something like a hydraulic cylinder to do elevation control on the barrel. And I'm back out hitting escape. What kind of electronics would we need? Let's just jump in there for a second. Oh, sorry, cylinder for elevation control. Right, okay, so we'll call this hydraulic amplifiers, maybe? Okay, what about when we want to figure out where they are? Uh, yeah, um, okay. I was talking about the hydraulics, but, but you're right. Uh, radar stuff. Exactly. I guess we are. Yeah. Exactly. We already had radar on the top level, so I'm going to cut it and then go into electronics and put it here. Cut it and paste it. Um, we've got some. I guess radar is a type of sensor, but it's kind of different than the other stuff. So we'll call this the hydraulic sensors. Okay. Okay. Um, their ship. What should be in there? Actually, actually. Okay. Where, where the ship actually is, not our perception of it. Okay, so, yeah. yeah, yeah. Position, please. Position of ship. Direction. So you might put in um, subsystems of. Sure. <laughs> so maybe uh, steering control. Steering control and speed control, those are kind of the things that they have control over. Okay, so I'm zooming out. <laughs> Come on guys, keep up. <laughs> okay, so I'm in, I'm in their ship, and then we had position of their ship, right? So I'm going to zoom down into that, and I had steering control and speed control. Um, let's let's try to hit them first. It's hard. It's a hard problem. So let's just see if we can hit them. That would kid us too. <laughs> Any, anything else you can think of? Okay. So within our gun, um, I'm gonna call this. Our gun 3D model, okay, um, and their ship. There's the position of their ship. Um, I'm I'm gonna make another thing called their ship 3D model. Because when we when we build that stuff out, we we don't. You'll see what I mean, but three-dimensional models have a whole bunch more signals and ports and blocks than our one-dimensional models do. We really want to abstract that and hide it. It gets messy real quick. So, okay. Um, that's pretty good. Anything else? We've got electronics. We've got shell tracking. We're missing a really critical piece, and I'm not going to tell you what it is because you better. You guys got to see this. How on earth do we hit them? We have to have fire control. We have to have something that aims this stuff. We have to have a set of software, because right now we have their ship, we have a way to track the things we fired, we have some stuff to control the can, but we don't have a clue how to point it at anything. So that's really important, right? Come on. Fire. Sub. So fire control is really important. Um, and I'm going to do two others. Um, that's software. That's software stuff. Yeah, that's software. I'm going to do two others 
um, target tracking and target prediction. Target tracking. And I'm just right clicking and dragging to make ah, right clicking and dragging to make new ones here. Target prediction. All right. So it's kind of messy right now. Um, I want to clean this up. So let's make a software side and a physical side, right? Because we know that the physical side is going to be operating in continuous time. We know that the software side is going to be operating in discrete time. So let's just organize it that way. So there's their ship, electronics, the hydraulics. The shell tracking is going to be um, it's going to be kind of like software, but it's, it's just mathematical. Um, fire control is software, target prediction, all these things. Um, our gun 3D model, these are all, okay. So now we've kind of separated this into two. I'm going to highlight all of these, hover over these three little dots, create a subsystem out of that. And I don't want all of these things. I just want, I just want a couple out, in and out ports. Okay, so we're not going to worry about this stuff today. That's the physical modeling. Physical modeling, <clears throat> all this stuff. Do this. I'm going to do the same thing on the other side. Um, but in order to save myself a little bit of time, I'm going to create a subsystem and call this software. And then. No, it's a good question, but it's um, the electronics themselves are, are is a physical system, right? And there's current flowing through it, and there's at, at a particular voltage and all that kind of thing. And so we're separating out between uh, I don't want to say virtual because there's a different meaning for that in Simulink, but stuff that operates in a theoretically discrete time, even though it might be sampling at something, it's still continuous. So I'm going to cut and paste these in, cut them out of there, paste them into here. OK, now I've got software. Um, everybody with me? I have a quick question. How yeah. did you change the physical modeling just to one in Oh, so there was a bunch of these sitting around, right? They were automatically, I just deleted them. Okay. That's it. But yeah, I just highlighted them and deleted them. And then all those ports went away. OK. So while we're in here, um, this is on the physical modeling side. I'm just going to change this to uh, command and feedback. And hit escape. And I'll do the same thing here. We might decide to change these later, but okay. <laughs> so this is good. Now we have a high-level model. We have just reduced the super complicated problem down to two blocks, two signals. As we go, those signals might become buses and you know, multiplexed and all that stuff. But right now, we don't care. We just know that we have some software we need to build, and we have some physical models that we need to, to build. That's all we care about for the moment. <clears throat> Time for a little bite of pizza.
there's nothing magical about what we did. We just took a complicated problem and said we're going to close our eyes on some things and put it in a box and work out some stuff. That's all. That's all we're doing here. This is kind of the nuts and bolts of top-down top-down um, model development. Okay, so we'll call this um, full underscore model. All right. <laughs> and remember the. That's fine. It's tough when there's different commands that mean different things in different software packages. You know, you hit F because that means fit in SolidWorks and then it doesn't do anything at all here. Anyway. Um, so that's saved. All right, so let's start solving some of these problems. That's that's kind of what we're doing. We're, we're boiling this down to bite-sized chunks and then we're going to knock off those chunks. So we've got about 30 minutes um, and we can do, I think we can do shell tracking in 30 minutes. Um, so it's going to be, we're going we're gonna to put it in software for the moment. Um, and I'm actually going to create a, a separate model just to work on it, just sort of as a um, shell tracking play one. Okay, so because uh, we're more familiar with MATLAB functions, and because when I started to sit down to do this, it seemed like a more natural way to solve the problem, um, uh, we're going to use a MATLAB function for this. So I'll go over to uh, user defined functions, MATLAB function. Okay. So we'll go into this, and now we've got a little bit of coding to do. I'm just going to call it function shell track is a function of. Okay. Now, what are the things that we would be looking at in order to figure out how to track a shell? Like, what are the what are all the inputs that we need to know <clears throat> in order to start tracking the shell? Well, like yes. Angle. Like, if it hasn't been fired yet, we know it's still here, huh. right? We, yeah, we need the initial angle, initial speed. Initial speed. What else do we need? Right. Well, okay. So uh, I'll simplify this a little bit. We're not going to have different powder loads. We're not going to have different shell types. We're just going to simplify this and say every single shell leaving has a certain muzzle velocity, and say, okay, that's what happens. But we kind of need to know when someone pulls the trigger, and we need to know that once they've pulled the trigger, then we can't fire that same shell again because it's already in flight. Okay. You follow what I'm saying? So we've got to keep track of these, and we're going to create this this uh, code model for it. So shell track, I'm going to call it one called fire one. And when that's true, that means somebody pulled the trigger, and that 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 means we're doing something. Um, we also need to know our elevation and bearing. Okay, so let me uh, explain a little bit about what those are. So for shell tracking, like we said, we've got to be able to keep track on things. We need to know if we're winning. So if we, do, if we don't track the shell, we can't tell if we hit the thing, uh, the destroyer. Okay, so let's talk a little bit about spherical coordinates. Um, anybody remember spherical coordinates? One of those things that, unless you've had it recently, you probably forgot. <laughs> you know, um, it's not complicated. It's just a different way of talking about coordinates in space, right? So there's x, y, and z, and that's, everyone's pretty much familiar with x, y, and z. Uh, from the perspective of firing a, a cannon, we're going to talk about elevation and bearing, or elevation and azimuth. So that's, that's that direction vector, right? Like, where on earth was I pointing this thing? Um, and radius is not very relevant to us, because once we, once we launch it, then we'll, we'll track it x, y, and z, and we'll just leave it that way. But for the for the launch part, we've got to figure out what does a particular you know ten degrees up, thirty five degrees over. What does that mean as far as how I launch it into space? Because we need that initial direction vector. So um, I'm not going to force you to go look that up. Um, so <clears throat> a little note here. Let's first 
<clears throat> let's first uh, start with the fire control. Um, no, uh, it's going to be a second because we've got to we've got to declare a bunch of stuff, right? We've got to keep track of some persistent variables because we don't want this every time step to reset all the shells over the course of the simulation. It, it needs to keep track. So first thing is, let's see here. What do we need to keep track of on a consistent basis? Um, like, okay, sure. Okay. Like number of shells we could fire kind of thing. Number of Sahila shells. I'm going to say n equals 100. Okay, I agree. Um, I'm sorry, what? Like your starting position. Yeah, you know, yeah, exactly where, where is everybody? And right now, everyone's going to start, we don't want to make this too ridiculous, so everyone will start at 0, 0, 0. <laughs> That's everybody's starting position, right? So I'm just going to call it pose, and then we put a semicolon, okay? And then we need to initialize uh, persistent variables. So we say if is empty pose, and if you don't, if you want to put it all in the same line, it just it's a little bit cleaner, I think. Um, we'll say pose equals zeros and by three, by three. Okay, so we said we're going to keep track of n number of shots. We said n equal to 100. So we're making this uh, matrix with 100 rows and three columns. Three columns are x, y, and z. Okay? Just because it's easier to think about. Um, all right. So that's initialized, though. We have to set an end because that was an if, if then else. Is n not persistent? Huh? Is n not persistent? Would it reset every time that function gets called? Or? It will, but. We just, it's, we're kind of using it like a constant, so we'd have to write persistent n and then initialize it, and when we're not really changing it, there's no point in making it persistent. Can you fire a shell and regularly keep it increasing? Okay, okay. I see your point. I see your point. Um, but um, when I, like, I was thinking number of shells we could total fire, like how many do we have in the magazine? And you're, you're talking about which one are we going to fire next? Right? Like, well, if we start with 100, we're going to be shooting. Like, do we have, are we assuming we have a significant amount of shells for this? No, we're saying we have 100. But every time that function gets called, would that reset to 100? What do you, what do you model on your plane? How many, what do we want to track every time? Yeah, exactly. That, that's so exactly right. When we fire, we have space to be able to track 100 different shells. Oh, okay, okay. But you're, you're right, we do have to track which ones are in flight and which ones are we about to fire. Okay, yeah, no, I, I, um, I originally meant the number of shells you might have on a ship or the island or whatever. Right. Um, so that is as your total ammunition stores. It's our total ammunition store. Yeah. yeah. Okay. So, but, but you're right. We do have to keep track of, um, I'm going to call it fire index. That's awesome, too. You fire 100, shell, 100 shells in the air every time. Yeah. And, and, at the end of today, uh, I'll try to. <laughs> 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 know, Sixteen inch rounds. <laughs> That's quite a rapid fire. Yeah. Um, yeah right. So let's let's get this initialized too. This is fire index. Uh, fire index equals one. And okay. Um, do we need anything else? Um, right, so MV equals, I think it's 2,500. Muzzle velocity, we'll have gravity equals minus 32 feet per second down, right? Um, This is complicated enough. Don't make negative, it. <laughs> okay. I understand what you're saying. If I said negative, I should I should say negative up, right? But, yeah. <laughs> I'm gonna call it down. Negative down. <laughs> okay. 
uh, forward negative. <laughs> okay. There's one more thing that um, isn't obvious, and I know it's, well, it wasn't obvious to me when I did this the first time. We have to keep track of whether we're going to leave gravity on and when the thing actually stops. So we actually need to track uh, the z velocity or the z gravity or whatever we want to call it. Because as soon as we splash down, we're going to turn gravity off for that shell. And it's just going to sit there. Otherwise, we're going to be tracking stuff going down into the ocean at the same velocity or I don't want to do that. So <clears throat> persistent, I'm going to call this ZXL. So the so equals zeros n by one. Okay. So while they're sitting there in the magazine, true gravity is acting on them, but they're on a shelf, so we're gonna assume that means no gravity. Okay. The only time we're gonna turn gravity on is when they're in flight, and as soon as we detect that they've hit. Like when they go subsurface, we're going to turn gravity off again, and then they'll just sit there again. Okay. So we've got, I think, all the stuff we need, unless I forgot something. And now we need to, what happens when we fire? So let's say if fire one equals one, and <clears throat> so what's going to happen here? We don't want to fire all of them. We just want to fire a shell with that particular index, right? So position fire index. Oop, I almost forgot. Sorry. We need velocity. Persistent vel for velocity. That was a big mistake. <laughs> if is empty, vel, vel equals They'll all be at rest when they're sitting on the magazine counter or whatever floor. Okay, so uh, if we fire one, then actually the um, total vel equals muzzle velocity, right? I'm just going to comment that out. Okay, now we get into the spherical uh, coordinates. So uh, this isn't a math class. We're not going to go through and try to derive. It's not, it's not super complicated. It's just not the point of the, topic, uh, the talk. So let's just think about it this way. When you think about spherical coordinates, we first let's separate the vertical from the xy plane. Okay? And the only thing that comes into play there is your elevation. So what portion of that uh, velocity it's going to go into the z-axis at a certain elevation. Okay? Right? And we can use trig to do that. What's that? It's a triangle math. Triangle math. Yep. So let's see. Let's see. Um, we'll call this z bell, and that's going to be muzzle velocity times. All right. Let's think about this for a second. Uh, so katoa, right? Sine equals opposite over hypotenuse, all that. But we have, what do we have? We need to know the vertical portion. So that's the opposite. And we have the hypotenuse as our muzzle velocity. And we have theta, which is our elevation. Okay. So that is, I wish I put this on a slide, then I don't have to do math in front of you. Um, so if you have, so opposite and hypotenuse, that is sine. Okay, good. Sine of elevation, uh, but we've got to remember that elevation is, uh, the sine function rather, is looking at things in terms of radians, and we're going to return elevation in terms of degrees, so we just need to, to convert. So divide by 360. Multiply by 2 times pi, right? Straightforward. And that's our z velocity. Okay. Now the other portion 
that doesn't get vertical is going to go into the xy plane, right? And that's how we get any distance out of this thing. So let's just call that xy, and that's going to be um, mv times cosine of elevation divided by 360 times 2 times pi. If you don't remember the math, it's easy to go check out what you forgot about trig or learn it the first time. <laughs> okay, so now we have x and y. Now we need to separate the components of x and y, right? So we projected our velocity into the xy plane. We need to figure out how much of it is in the x direction, how much of it is in the y direction, right? So xy is kind of like our new mv. So we say uh, xvel equals <coughs> cosine, right, of Uh, right, I don't think I called it azimuth. You're, you're right, Ron, it is azimuth. I called it bearing. I, th I was trying to think of the words that they'd actually say, you know, like, I don't know, um, if they called it out. Yeah, I, I, I don't think azimuth is what they call it. I think they call it bearing. So that's why I called it that. So it's bearing divided by 360 times 2 times pi and y vel equals the other part of it, the sine part of it. So that's bearing divided by 360 times 2 times pi. Okay, good. All right. So now. What? Oh, you're right. Thank you. Thank you, Colin. I am missing the x y times. Otherwise, this is not going to go very fast. Okay, um, good. All right, so now I need to just update, not position, but velocity. Any of this look familiar? Just sort of a modified three-dimensional bouncing ball, right? Uh, and we're just going to give it an, an initial velocity and say the x-coordinate equals x-velocity and vel fire index 2 equals y y velocity and vel fire index 3 equals z velocity. Okay, good. So, good. So now we have something that we've got something that can pull a trigger. Now we need something that will update in time to figure out how this thing is going to fly. So that's pretty straightforward. Um, the time update portion. Uh, let's see. Okay, so let's do it uh, in integration order. How about that? Um, <clears throat> so, um, oh, you know what? We forgot something very important. We need sampling time for our time update. So, velocity. Uh, and we're going to use a for loop to go through these. So 4i equals 1 to n. Remember, n was our number of shells, so we're just going to go through and update the whole magazine of shells. And if they're sitting on the, if they're sitting on the shelf, there's no acceleration, there's no velocity, they'll just keep sitting there. If they've been launched, then it'll continue to update them and their velocity and so on. Oh, uh, we also, I almost forgot, sorry. Turn on gravity. Um, this is... What do we call it? ZXL. And ZXL is n by 1. So Z XL fire index equals gravity. Gravity is negative, so I just say gravity, right? I'm looking at your time. Okay, so, <laughs> so, uh, all right, so. For each shell, we want to do this, so let's update the velocities first. So let's let's ignore wind resistance right now and we'll just talk about, let's just assume this thing flies and gravity pulls it down, and that's how it goes. So uh, velocity i, because we're going to update all of them, uh, the x portion 
Oh, we don't even care about that. We just care about the z portion, right? Equals velocity i3 plus um, z excel i times ts. So that'll pull it down one sample time at a time. And then we need to update the positions. And so um, we just go through and do all of them. Position x equals uh, equals position i1 plus, and how fast is x going? It's going x velocity. So velocity of i1 times ts. Position i2 uh, equals position i2 plus, everybody with me so far? I'm just kind of, uh, this is a lot like the bouncing ball, we're just talking about it in three dimensions, so i3, so I'm not spending a lot of time talking about it, position i3 plus velocity 3 times ts, and that's pretty much it, that's our time update, that was straightforward, and then the last part is we need to talk about splashdown. update. So we need to check all of them again. So we'll do this again for i equals 1 to n. And can I, yeah. Would it make the other 99 um, shells fall through the earth? Is there any condition for the other ones? Because it looks like you're adding the acceleration no, at, at velocity. I am, but uh, so it looks like we're accelerating into the ground all the time, but um, we initialized ZXL as zeros. And the only time it gets updated to gravity is on a one by one basis. Got it. Okay. Thank you. So, yeah. <clears throat> so now we just need to detect when has this thing gone subsurface of the water. So that's straightforward to do. We just need to check the position and the z-axis and see if that's, I just said negative two, for two feet underwater, we'll call that splash. Right? So if position i in the third dimension is less than minus two, and so this is just really, what do we have to update to tell this thing that you're done? <laughs> Turn, off gravity. Turn off gravity, what else though? We have, to, we have to stop the velocity because it has all these velocities in x, y, and z, and it's just going to keep going. <laughs> so, uh, so you're right. Z excel i by, oh, it's just i, equals 0. And velocity i, okay, and I'm going to. I'm going to be tricky here, but you guys can figure out what this means, I think. Because I don't want to write it three times, right? So I'm just, yeah, I'm just saying that all of the columns in that particular row are zero. And that's why MATLAB's great, because it lets you do that quickly. Um, Could you have done that on the top line, too? Would that syntax have worked out roughly the same? Uh, which top line? Towards the top of the window, the front window, those three positions, yeah. Um, Probably, probably. I would check it though. <laughs> so since I don't want to check it, <laughs> yeah, probably it would work right. Yeah. yeah, I would think so. Good call. Probably work right to put that uh, colon operator. I completely forgot about it until you mentioned. I'm like, oh shit, math, well, math lab. That's right. Yeah, years. yeah, yeah. Okay, so we have everything. We have initialized variables. We're tracking our positions and our velocities. Our acceleration is constant. So we don't have to track that all the time. We just basically need to turn it on and off with a, a, a vector of what you know whether we're accelerating it or not, and we have some fire control. Um, I want to. Well, yeah, let's let's run this and there's this is kind of like an enabled thing. Do you have a comment, Colin? Yeah.
So, I guess what we need, that's a really good point. I didn't think about that till now. So we, I guess I have a question on that. I guess if you have a, an overall sample time and you're tracking both units, it, it, it doesn't really matter. The sample time here is equal to the sample time there, and then both the positions are equal when you have it there, right? So don't we really need to keep track of that? Well, I guess the, the situation, so the question is, well, do we need to keep track of when it touched down or not? But the problem is, this whole thing's happening in time. So what if the situation is we launched a shell and it hit in front of the boat, and then a little while later the boat sailed over it? With that doesn't mean we hit it. So you're right. We do need to track time. Um, that's our fourth dimension that we we got to hit. So uh, yeah, darn it, I hate making mistakes. Okay. Um, we can just make that a vector though, uh, T impact, we'll call it, and we'll initialize it and say if it's empty, T impact, T impact equals zeros in by one, and, okay, and the only thing we need to do is record it at that particular time. But right now, we, the function has no idea what system time that was. So we need to bring that into. So we have sample time. Let's bring in t also. And that'll be our simulation time. Thanks for catching that call. That's good. Uh, so we have splashdown. So then we just say, um, shoot, what did I call that? I called it. T impact. So T impact I equals T. Now we got it. Save that. Okay. All right. I'm willing to try. I think we got this one. Let's get in there and look at it. Um, oh, it would be great if we actually output these positions so we could see what happened. <laughs> So we should probably do that. Um, so we need an output variable. We'll call it pose out equals pose out equals equals pose. Okay. Good. All right. Now we can just put some constants on this thing. Um, All right. What this is actually going to do is every sample time it's going to launch a new shell. But that doesn't matter for us right now. We just want to see if we can launch one and track it real quick. And that'll kind of do us for today. What, what we could do in the long run, what we will do, is detect a fire rising edge. And we'll just write a little MATLAB function that can do that. But for the moment, it's, you know, if this runs at 50 hertz, it's going to go and shoot all of them out there. doesn't matter for now. <laughs> It's just an automatic 16-inch gun. <laughs> yeah. So we'll say this is 30 degrees elevation. And uh, <laughs> a bearing of 45 degrees. And um, we won't get too complicated here. We'll just say we'll track these at, uh, how about 1 100th of a second? We don't have any collisions or anything to worry about, really. Um, and what's that? I'm going to make it a little bit smaller just because the position update will be a little bit off if we don't catch it pretty close to hitting the water surface. If we're going really fast and it's one one hundredth of a second later, we might be like 30 feet underwater, which would put us at a different XY coordinate. So I turn it up to 500. One five hundredth, and then a clock. I just need a simulation clock. I can feed in there. I need a workspace variable. Um, nope. 
I needed two workspace. So it's a something I can dump stuff into. And you remember, I need to change this not to time series, but array. Because it's a little, just a little easier to work with. We'll call this pose. And I think we're good to go. Oh, don't, can't forget. we got to change our block parameters, change our sample time to 1 over 500. And OK. All right, so this is 10 seconds. But we know that it's going to take longer for this thing to hit the ground. So let's give it like 60 seconds. This isn't going to be in real time, so this don't, doesn't really take that long. So you have to manually update the, uh, the update time in the function as well as that constant that you feed into the function? Uh, say it again. So you have constant number three, which is 1 by 100, and you just updated the MATLAB function to step time and things like that, right? Yeah. And we, you remember last time we built something that generated TS for us, so we could use that next time. Um, but you have to set the block parameter because it doesn't know how fast you want to run the function. Right, right, right. Yeah. Okay. Um, okay. I think that should work. I think I already ran it, but just in case, while we run it again, let's check out the MATLAB workspace and see what we've got. Uh, position is 100 by 3 by 30,001. That looks about right. So. We have 100 shells, three coordinates, and 30,000 time uh, uh, slices. So let's write a little function to visualize this thing quick, and then we can get out of here. So format compact CLC. OK. Now something else um, we need to deal with is the fact that we uh, we need to squeeze, okay, so we have a three-dimensional variable, and we need to squeeze it down to one or two dimensions. So as we start picking things out of it, it's going to have singular dimensions. So in other words, if we took the first index of, of that array, it's going to have dimension one by one by one. So it, it'll have three dimensions, and MATLAB doesn't like working with that. So we have to use the squeeze command to make that actually just one thing. Um, so let me show you what I mean. So um, x, we'll say x equals squeeze, and we'll just look at the first shell, right, because we, we're rapid firing these things. So uh, squeeze, and it's called position. I just want to look at the first one, and I look want to look at the x-coordinate, and I want to look at all of the time, oops, all of the times. And that should do it. And then I'm just going to copy and paste because I'm lazy. Make this Y. Make that Z. And change this to the second coordinate and the third coordinate. Save. I'll call this post1. OK. So if I run this, x, y, and z, 30,000 by 1. If I took out the squeeze, I just want to show you what this looks like because MATLAB will complain about it when you try to plot something that's more than two dimensions. See how it's one, x is 1 by 1 by 30,001, and that's what it's going to complain about. So we use the squeeze just to get rid of those singleton dimensions. But you need to be squeezed twice because you have, it still has an extra singular dimension. It's not just like a... Oh, it gets rid of all of them. Oh, but that's, so it's MATLAB, right? Matrix laboratory. It, think, it thinks everything's a matrix. Even the scalar is one by one. So it just doesn't like it when we uh, try to make things more than two. OK, so that's good. Run that. That works right. What do we do now? We plot x, y, z. But we can't use plot, because plot is a two-dimensional plotting function. We have to use plot three. Not a big deal. Plot three. And let's run that. Okay. Okay. I don't think our gravity works right. Sort of looks like it just kept going there. Let's just check out the gravity real quick. <sighs> gravity equals minus 32. Okay, and uh, 
time update. Does time update worry about it? Yes. It takes its current velocity and adds what should be a negative number to that. And that's a third dimension. It's the ith element. You guys seeing something I'm missing? So I'm going to run it with a breakpoint and see if it's actually what it's supposed to be. Okay, it's minus 32. That's good. Huh? What's that? Oh. So uh, you guys haven't seen this yet, but let's try it. Open though. No, oh, that's I forgot. I can't do that in context this way. Um, let's see. Why is it this guy's not working? There's the Excel. For which? Okay. <laughs> it is conditional. That part is. Okay. Uh, I had an issue earlier with uh, looking at this, and there was something weird about the first fire. So let's just look at the second one. It's just to see if. Okay. Give me a couple minutes, we'll figure this out. Um, first shot, x, y, and z, all the time indices. Okay. Now, what are we what are we forgetting about? We're forgetting about something here. Gravity's negative. Position, velocity, fire. Oh. Oh! You know what? We never updated fire index, so we keep firing the same stupid thing. We never incremented fire index, right? So we, if, until we do that, we're going to keep doing and over and over and over. So I guess it would have been good. We should have done the animation in time. That would have been a telltale thing. Uh, so right after fire one, update the fire index. Fire index equals fire index plus one plus plus. <laughs> okay, uh, so let's run this model again. Is there some sort of license on that? You know, I don't know. Uh, velocity. Up top. Sorry, we lost that. Uh, Index 101. What did I forget here? Fire one. Oh. If fire index is greater than 100, then fire index, we'll keep firing the last one equals 100. It, went out, it had an array out of bounds uh, error, so we just had to fix that. OK, so that should run, which it did. Now we can post-process that. Do, 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 where'd you go? Hey, hey, check that out. That's cool. We just need more time. It, it, Took more than 60 seconds, the shot did. So let's give it 100 and see if we can. We were, we were shooting fast there. <coughs> All right. Run that. While that's running, I'm going to say um, grid on uh, axis equal xlim. Okay, so I'm going to make this 
mile radius of 20, uh, make it 40, and feet per mile equals 5,280. And so XLM is going to be from minus mile radius times feet per mile to thanks. Times feet per mile. Mile M is the same. Mile radius times feet per mile. Mile radius times feet per mile. Oops. And Z lamb. I didn't try to do more stuff today, huh? Uh, we'll have this at minus 5 to, uh, oh, how far in the air do we want to look? <clears throat> this thing probably went pretty high. Let's look at it real quick and just see how high did we go. 2.5 E4. Um, 2 point, uh, we'll make it 4 E4 feet. Okay. Save. And the label, just call that height so we don't forget what we're looking at. All right, check this out. Just out of our range. So that's our first thing, and we don't know if we hit anything yet because we haven't written the code to figure that out, but that's pretty cool. Um, can you guys see this okay? So that's about 45 degrees bearing, right? Between X and Y, and we launched at about 30 degrees elevation. Looks about right. And we're out there, I think I put in 30 miles or so. So that's a pretty stinking long shot. <laughs> we need some air friction probably to hold us back. But anyhow, that's it for tonight. So thanks for sticking with me an extra 15. That was, that was good.